Good afternoon and welcome to 110 year old Alumni Hall. That's right, 110 years old. That's original stained glass you can see in those windows back there. Those are the original balustrades up above. It's the original flooring. All of it refurbished just in the past year. This hall has been home to dance troops from New York City, scores of sopranos and concert violinists, hundreds of dances and proms, a couple dozen volleyball and basketball teams, think about that for a minute, uh, and even a few badminton players. Um, we found some shuttlecocks up in the balustrades up there. We think that Sister Benedict Joseph hit them. <laughs> but as far as I know, this is the first inaugural symposium that we're holding here in Alumni Hall. And how appropriate that this symposium concerns the social fabric, community service, and all the promise that those words, community and service, imply. At Mount Aloysius, we embrace the idea that the formation of personal values is a key part of any education. Our college website is filled with examples in practice of the core values of the Sisters of Mercy, mercy and justice, service and hospitality. Every student, every team, every club, every organization performs community service while here. It's written into their charters, and as the students can tell you, their class assignments, and we hope that most of them make it a habit when they leave here. And as we work to ensure that our students are 21st century capable, that they are tech fluent, that they get it about the importance of lifelong learning, we also work hard not to lose sight of those qualities that have distinguished our graduates in the workplace and in the community for a century. Their qualities of empathy and compassion, their habits of civic engagement and civil discourse, and their capacity for genuine human interaction. Whether it's at the hospital, in the classroom, or on the shop floor, we want our Mount Aloysius graduates to use their heads and their hearts as they move through life. In effect, to synthesize faith with learning, to develop competence with compassion, and to put their gifts at the service of others, as it says in our mission statement. So it's absolutely appropriate that our very first inaugural seminar concerns the university's role in the social fabric, because it is part of the DNA of this institution right back to its founding 158 years ago. I have one more role to fill here today, and that's to introduce our distinguished panel. First, Sister Marianne Stevens. She's been the president of the College of St. Mary in Omaha for 17 years. The college is a leader in community service with service programs that outreach to single mothers, to recent immigrants, to low-income science and math students, among many other innovative programs. With a doctorate in religion and education, her primary research area focuses on ethics and moral theology. And we felt that background and her practice in the field, in the heartland of America, made her perfect for this panel. And we thank her for coming all the way from Nebraska today. Dr. Shar Gray is currently the executive director of the Pennsylvania Campus Compact, the premier inter-college community service organization in the country. She has worked as a single campus community service director at Lafayette College in our state, and she did her doctoral work on the impact of service learning on social, personal, civic, and learning outcomes. Dr. Gray is the co-author of an invaluable document in her field. It's called At a Glance. It's an annotated bibliography of service learning research. We felt that her role with Campus Compact and her expertise on the ground with service learning made her perfect addition for this panel. Our third panelist is Dr. Ira Harkavy. He's an historian who has now served uh, at the University of Pennsylvania for almost 30 years um, and now serves as its vice president. He is both Penn's and Pennsylvania's guru on community service and civic engagement. Dr. Harkavy has been the founder, the co-founder, or a founding board member of just about every significant development in the field in this state and of many nationally. He pioneered Penn's WEPIC program, 
which stands for the West Philadelphia Improvement Corps, a national model for civic engagement by urban-based institutions of higher education. He served as a founding board member of PennServe with Governor Robert P. Casey and future U.S. Senator Harris Wofford. I was a very junior partner in that enterprise. And he helped to bring to fruition the National AmeriCorps program under President Clinton. Ira's most recent publication is his book, Dewey's Dream, Universities and Democracies in an Age of Education Reform. Finally, the co-chair of both our symposia committee um, and our moderator today is Sister Helen Marie Burns. Sister Helen Marie is an author of several tomes on the foundress and the history of the Sisters of Mercy. She's a former senior administrator within the Sisters of Mercy nationally and regionally. So if I was a community service guru, Sister Helen Marie is a mercy guru. She's designed dozens of programs and curricula built around service, education, religion, and justice, and has taught in both secondary and higher education in three states so far. Most importantly for us, Sister Helen Marie Burns is the Vice President for Mission Integration at Mount Aloysius College, where she oversees our mission focus at this institution of higher education as both Catholic and Mercy, which includes all of our community service and religious programming. Sister Helen Marie also serves as a mentor to individual members of our staff and faculty, to an always long list of students, and especially to the president. Sister Helen Marie holds a doctorate from the University of Iowa and an honorary doctorate from our sister school, the University of Detroit Mercy. We're delighted to have people of this caliber join us today, uh, and we look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Sister. Good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have you here, and thank you, Dr. Foley, for that wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure to serve as moderator of this distinguished panel, and I think my task is made easier by the distinguished nature of the gathering here. Their lives really have been and are continuing contribution to the role of the university in the social fabric. And it's a role that is essential to all campuses, has been, I suspect uh, will be and certainly is in our current world, in our current na national circumstance. But it's especially important, the contribution of the university to the social fabric, especially important to those colleges and universities that have a religious base. For ourselves, a Roman Catholic tradition, a tradition that honors the history and tradition of the Sisters of Mercy. As one Catholic theologian said, the Christian character of an institution is not measured by religious practices, but rather by service to a more human, just configuration of society, by service to the configuration of a people of God as leaven for a world in which all can live. Within the tradition of the Sisters of Mercy, that concern for a more human configuration of society has always held a central place. So service within this tradition is not just simply transactional. It's not just about giving water to the thirsty or clothing the naked or reaching out to shelter the homeless. But it's also transformational. It's about asking the questions that say, why? Why is this person hungry? Why is this person homeless? What are we not doing as a society in order to bring comfort to these lives and to these people. So the transformational quality of the service is a reflective response shaped for ourselves around the questions stemming from virtues of mercy, of justice, of hospitality, as well as service. So without further ado, let's move to the insights which each of our panelists will bring to us. We've decided on certain ground rules. I'm going to give us all the ground rules so that we can keep ourselves honest in this regard. We're going to ask that the panelists speak for about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. We'll give them a little edge there, but not more than 20. The lights go out or something happens. <laughs> then we're going to sit down, a little talk show, 
interact with one another in terms of the content that we've heard, and then we'll open it in the last 20 minutes to yourselves. Enlarging the circle, you may ask questions, you may offer comments, you may challenge whatever it is that you wish to do with the panel. And we will finish uh, hopefully by a quarter to five, so that gives you a sense of how long your bodies need to be resting in the chairs in which they are. So, but without further ado then, I do want to encourage our uh, panelists to uh, keep in mind that little plan, and we're going to ask Sister Mary Ann to lead us off with her remarks. Thank, Thank you. you. Excuse me. First of all, I want to um, thank Sister Helen Marie for organizing this panel. Thank you, Tom, mm -hmm. um, for your gracious in invitation to be at uh, these inaugural ceremonies. Inaugurations are really, really important um, for colleges across the United States, I believe, because they symbolize the calling from the community to the president. So one of the things I hope you realize that you're doing these days is you're really confirming the call of Tom to be your president, and I'm sure he will be a good one. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to be here to speak about the role specifically of the Catholic University in the social fabric. You know, uh, the Second Vatican Council had a number of documents, and one of them was on education. And in that document, they said the role of Catholic education was to call for forth those great souled people so desperately needed by our times. And so the question for me is, how might a small Catholic college, and by the way, a small Catholic college in the middle of Western Pennsylvania, I was gonna say nowhere, but that's all right. I mean, you know, in the middle of Western Pennsylvania, how might a small Catholic college respond to Catholic social teaching? And more particularly, how might this small Catholic college founded by the Sisters of Mercy respond to Catholic social teaching? And so just a bit about Catholic social teaching, some of you I'm sure are aware of this, but there's four basic principles underlying the Catholic intellectual tradition with regard to a response to the social fabric. The first principle is that every human being has dignity, no matter what, no matter what. And so I used to say to students when I taught moral theology, no bullseyes on Saddam Hussein, no bullseyes on your t-shirts for anyone, all right? Every human person has dignity. Second principle, that dignity can only be realized in community. We can't have, get that dignity or the gift of it by ourselves. We <coughs> need others to call forth and to help us realize our dignity. And the third principle, the community is, organized, is uh, obligated then to organize itself for the common good and for the upholding of the rights of the individual. And then fourthly, because there are some people who will always fall between the cracks of whatever the social fabric is, whether it's health care or education and how we organize ourselves to respond to people's needs, there will always be people who fall beneath those cracks. We have to have, according to Catholic social teaching, a preferential option for the poor, a preferential option for those folks who fall between the cracks of the social systems, the common good, the community that we have organized to respond to need. So that's a little bit about Catholic social teaching. What about the Sisters of Mercy? Again, I think a number of you probably know this, but we were founded by an early 19th century Irish woman, Catherine Macaulay, whose passion for the poor, whose passion for the poor and the vulnerable emanated from two, uh, two pieces of her own history. One, that she saw her father as a very young child feeding uh, children who were hungry at the gate around their house. So that was one. The second one, she had an encounter with a young servant girl who had been taken advantage of by a gentleman um, in the house in which this servant girl worked. And so what she did was she took an inheritance that she received and she put up a house in a very fashionable se section of Dublin so that young women who were coming into the city from the rural areas to be servant girls in the homes of the gentry could have a safe place to live. 
So she created a place where the dignity of those women would be honored. Mary Sullivan, um, who's a sister of mercy from Rochester, New York, and is the foremost biographer, contemporary biographer of Catherine McCauley, notes in a 2006 article this about Catherine's ideas of education. She says, and I quote, in Catherine's view, the overriding purpose of every educational endeavor which seeks to be faithful to the revelation of God is consolation. Yes, consolation. The primary purpose of all teaching that is born of God, the supreme educator, is to console, to comfort. Thus, for Catherine, the purpose of all mercy education is not primarily to develop students' intellectual skills or to teach them information and formulas, however necessary that may be, but to comfort, to encourage, and to console them in the most thorough and lasting way possible. So how does this human dignity realized in community, preferential option for the poor, or this consolation of Catherine McCauley's work in a small Catholic university. First of all, I'm going to let my two colleagues talk about the kind of outreach that should pour out from that foundation towards the wider community. We never want our colleges and universities, especially those that have religion as a base, to be insular, ivory towers, if you will. But I think there's something more basic here more foundational, and that's hospitality. By hospitality, I mean the creation of space, the creation of space for an interaction with the other, the different one. Let me tell you two stories, and these are true stories. One is about a young woman, 29 years old, named Daisy Choi. Daisy had um, a certificate in, uh, what do they call them, a, a certificate in nursing where she went into a, a nursing home and was able to work. It was pre uh, a registered nurse, a CNE, I think they call them. Yeah, CNA. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyway, she had that. She came to College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska, where I work, and she started in our nursing program. She had already done her sciences at a community college, but she had gotten mostly C's in science. She didn't realize how necessary science was to the nursing profession. But she came, she went through the nursing courses, she got to the final course, which is called complex at our place. I don't know what they call it here. But anyway, it's that course where you synthesize everything, and you're supposed to be the critical thinker and know how to put it all together. And she flunked it. She mm. not only flunked it once, she flunked it twice. <laughs> And indeed, that meant that she was out of the nursing program because our policies say if you flunk a course twice or if you flunk two courses, you're out. And somebody's nodding and that's probably pretty typical. Okay. So Daisy goes to the dean and she is passionate about being a nurse. Passionate about being a nurse. And so the dean goes to the nursing faculty and says, what are our options here? This young woman has taken out student loans. She has to pay them back. She's taken all these nursing courses, and she has nothing. So they thought and they thought about it, and they recognized her passion, and so they said, she needs to go back and take all of her sciences, chemistry, biology, and microbiology, and then she needs to go back through those nursing courses with that kind of background. And so they came to me and they said, would I let her do that free? And I said, okay. If she's willing to do all that work, I'll let her do it free. And indeed, Daisy not only passed her ASN, she's gone on to get a BSN, and now she has an MSN. Okay? Story number one. Story number two. T.S. and Spesic, a young woman from Baltimore, Maryland, who had a child, inner city Baltimore, uh, had a child as she entered her senior year of high school. She found out about College of St. Mary because we have a residence hall for single mothers and their children. Mm -hmm. She came to College of St. Mary as a very shy, young 18-year-old with, with an infant, literally, um, and kind of floundered. Well, we started a swimming program the next year. And the swim coach put out the word that he was accepting swimmers of all levels because we wanted to get this thing started. T. Essence had never swum in her life. Mm. But 
she heard that call and she thought, well, gee, this will help me get in shape. And a couple of her friends were going to do it and get in shape, but they had swum before. She went to the coach and she said, can I get on the swim team? <laughs> and he said, yes. Even I was shocked. He said, yes. <laughs> and that team went to the NAIA Nationals that year. OK, story number two. Those stories illustrate how I think, I got to find my Catholic, what Catholic colleges I believe need to be all about. I'm not sure we can do these things. I lost my place, just a minute here. Um, what Catholic colleges need to be all about. I think they need to be places of hospitality, welcoming the stranger. What is involved, according to one author, is the manner and thinking at all levels, from the board to the president to the faculty to the staff to the students. It is the atmosphere of collegial life, the tenor of the campus, the mutual relations, the willingness to listen to and experience the other side of the situation. This is hard work. To tear away from our computers, our tasks, and to learn from the other side of the situation. I dare say that few swim team coaches would let a student who had never learned to swim walk on to the team. And yet this is what provided the foundation for T. Essence's confidence. And she will tell you that today, that turned her into a confident woman, swimming. And as I said, it didn't hurt the team any. <laughs> this was about the coach, yes. But it was also about the tenor of a campus that allowed T essences, the T essences of the world, to hear that all levels are welcome and believe that no experience was a level. It was about the other voice and the power of the coach's hearing. Daisy is the same way. What school would be willing to listen? You failed. You're out. And more compassionately even, we don't want you to fail again. But someone heard her passion and knew that passion can carry people through the hard work to realize dreams. Passion can carry us through the hard work to realize dreams. So OK, we are not lowering our standards. But with help, you go back through chemistry, anatomy, and micro at our expense. What's one more student? Get B's or above, that was the criteria, and then repeat the nursing sequence. I thought she would walk away, but no, she listened. I don't tell these stories to provide a template for swim coaches or nursing faculties. <laughs> Believe me. I tell these stories to underscore what I think Catholic social teaching involves at its base, and to illustrate how Catherine McCauley's consolation, encouragement, might work. It's about creating space for the odd, the strange, the different. I think such, such spaces of hospitality are very important in our world today because education is not about depositing information or collecting data and cataloging it. Education is about asking people to consider information or ide ideas and then to reconsider one's own ideas as a result of the conversation. Now, I dare say that this is much easier to do when you're embracing a person that you know, a daisy or a essence. It's much more difficult when you're trying to embrace differing ideas that people have. But if we can't figure out how to do that in these places that are small, I think it's harder, much harder to do in a larger university, any of these kinds of things, because you're much more like a number. Mm -hmm. all right? We can do this. We can hear the voices. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we have a foundation so that we can hear the voices. The tenor of the place says, raise your voice, tell us who you are, and tell us what you think. And even if you think differently than me, I'm going to listen to you. And we're going to figure out where we are in all of this. Because the truth of the matter is, all we have is us. <laughs> all we have is us. 
This kind of atmosphere, I believe, undermines the power of those who would like to separate us, those who use ideology to keep us apart and keep us from understanding that indeed we are all in this together. And we see that on the televisions every day. Do you watch Fox or do you watch CNN? Very different ideologies and we keep them separate or somebody does. The right answers to any of our dilemmas are only going to be found in learning to reach out to one another, not ignoring or skimming over the differences, but rather believing that we can learn from them. Now these are only hints and guesses, and maybe when we discuss at the panel, I can talk about some of the things that keep us from being able to do this, some of the obstacles. But for now, thank you for engaging in what I think is great work, the great work of a small Catholic university founded by the Sisters of Mercy in Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. We're very pleased, and I think you've set us up with a couple of really good points for conversation later on. The challenge of the individual in the system, even though it be small, but also the challenge of the social teachings in the system. I think my anticipation is that Dr. Harkavy will be broadening the conversation and talk about what it is at a larger Thank you university. Thank you. First, I want to indicate what an enormous pleasure and honor it is to be here for this very important occasion and to be a member of such a distinguished panel. I also want to say what a particular personal pleasure it is to be able to do this for my friend Tom Foley, or President Foley. I've known uh, Mr. Foley since the 1980s when, as he indicated, we were engaged in trying to do good works here and elsewhere. And I've always been deeply impressed and, in fact, admired the way that Tom has connected his principles and values to have an impact on the world. So although I um, don't want to sound like an ex-governor of New Jersey who used <laughs> to talk about, uh, use a term, he used to say perfect together, my sense is that it is a perfect, and I believe will be a perfect development to have Mr. Foley president of this great institution. So thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. Let me t indicate what I'd like to do is give a talk backwards. I'm not going to stand backwards. I'm going to talk about general concepts and then talk about our specific work in West Philadelphia, general ideas. And I'm going to start with the punchline. The colleges and universities are and should be, and really should be, because they don't always function this way, core institutions to solve local problems that, in fact, are universal problems. Poverty unemployment, poor health care, inadequate housing, that they have a special responsibility based, as my colleague has indicated, on mission. And it is certainly with Catholic institutions core to the mission, but every type of higher educational institution except for for-profit institutions in this great country of ours was founded with the ideal of service. Religiously based, non-religiously based, but service to our fellow human beings and improving society. And that in fact, to give again the punchline of my talk, the conclusion that unless colleges and universities are engaged deeply, powerfully, seriously, significantly in the work of solving the problems of our society and helping to educate democratic creative, caring citizens of a democracy, America itself will not be able to fulfill or realize its founding promise, its promise of a, fair, of a society of justice and fairness for all citizens. The colleges and universities are crucial. Now, to stop backwards a little bit on our own work, where it comes from, if I look at the big problem we've been working on in our work, it really is a problem that's very important today in this society. There's all this debate about the role of government and the role of private sector and the role of nonprofits. And as my colleague indicated, often people can't speak together. They're separated. It is our job to bring them together. 
And the work we've been doing in West Philadelphia has been, as Tom remembers, President Foley remembers, the development of schools as hubs of neighborhoods, centers of democracy, centers of bringing people together. That idea is an old idea in America. It comes out of the settlement house workers, Jane Addams <laughs> in Chicago, Lillian Walls in New York, and these great settlers, these activist female settlers who believed that women had an important role in society and also believed that they needed to help their fellow human beings, said that although settlement houses are scattered, schools are everywhere. And they brought nursing services and health services and food services into local schools to serve children. In 1902, John Dewey, the great American pragmatic philosopher who was schooled significantly by Jane Addams, said, I want to believe that every school should be a social center, should be the hub of the neighborhood in which all people in that neighborhood, from the smallest infant to the most senior adult, from really birth to 99, would be able to have a community and learn together. He said the school should reach out and reach in. It should touch other agencies, but it should be a hub of democracy and of learning and the ability of people to work together to solve the problems of life. The idea that only with others do we genu gen genuinely fulfill ourselves? Only, do we said, in amiable discourse, when human beings talk together, do we realize and practice democracy. Democracy is not about, he said, just voting every four years. It's a way of life. It's how we live. It's how we live. So the work we have been doing in West Philadelphia, a community of Significant poverty still. Significant poverty after doing this work since 1985. That's a while ago. <laughs> since 1985, we are still a community, and it's a we of poverty. But the argument here was that schools could be hubs of neighborhoods and could, in fact, help to sustain, develop, and improve neighborhoods and educate children and adults effectively to be active, caring citizens. And the idea was that this would be a way of creating partnerships, and the community schools required partners. If you look at the history of community schools since Dewey's essay, they're up and they're down. There were great developments in rural Kentucky and West Virginia. Great Kentucky, uh, in, by a wonderful student of Dewey's. But that disappeared when the funding went away. And in New York City, in East Harlem, there was a very famous school called Benjamin Franklin High School, led by Leonard Cavello. And when he retired, the community school went away. And the Mott Foundation puts lots of money, put lots of money in community schools that didn't sustain. The argument was you need a partner. And our work said it needed to be for everybody's benefit, the university and college. The college and university working with its local school and community where we all learn and work together. Now, I said before, and I will talk about the specific history of that, that there was a big idea behind this about government and relationship to nonprofits and business and universities. Well, a number of years ago, the greatest figure in our field, in many ways, who passed away about four or five years ago, gave a talk that I had the great pleasure of attending. His name is, was John, is John Gardner. John Gardner was a great mm -hmm. citizen. He was a mentor to one of our mentors, to Harris Warford. And John Gardner said that, in fact, if you look at the world and the best businesses in the world, they're not <coughs> hierarchical cultures, most of them. They represent people working together. And then he said, if we're going to solve the problems of the poor in our communities, you have to bring all the federal agencies, housing, HUD, education, labor, transportation, commerce, health and human services all together. He says, that's not enough. He says, you have to get those state agencies, such as labor and industry in Pennsylvania, education, working together, Department of Welfare, 
And they have to work with the, the federal agencies. And then you got to get the city agencies, the Department of Human Welfare, the Education de Department, the, this, the Human Services Department, working together in community. Why in community? That's where we live. We live in places. You can't have all this separation, all this fragmentation. You have to bring those resources together. But you know what Gardner said? That's not enough. Not enough. He said because to create real democracy, real partnerships, you have to bring faith-based institutions. You have to bring schools. You have to bring businesses. You have to bring community-based organization. You have to bring labor. You have to bring all of the organizations together to work in a place to improve the quality of life of young people and the community. And then he said, and you have to bring colleges and universities. And he said, if you don't bring colleges and universities, you will not succeed long term. And I'll even take that for the, sh for the short term. First of all, why won't you succeed? Well, first of all, before getting to that, what is so wonderful about every college and university? We don't always achieve what my distinguished colleagues talk about, about that sense of community, but that's what we're supposed to do. Dr. Stevens indicated we're supposed to be that. We are supposed to be centers of community. And in fact, we are places. We are places in the ground, in the world. And he said, you are, we're not moving. You, this institution has been here 100 and how many years? 58, I would say 159, glad you corrected me. 158 <laughs> years. And 158 years, the university I'm from has been in Philadelphia since 1740, and in West Philadelphia since 1873, I believe. That's a while. Mm -hmm. That's a while. We're place-based. So we can partner, we can work together, we can be with others, and we can, and I'll get to this, benefit very significantly. But then there's another part of that story. He said, how are you going to get the talent to solve the problems of our communities? Where is it going to come from? It's going to come from you, students, young people. The young people who are getting educated need to be educated in the world for citizenship by helping to improve the world. And he said, if we're going to solve the problems of our cities, we need the best people in public service. If we're going to solve the problems of our city, we need the best educators. If we need, we're going to solve the problems of our city, we need the best nurses, the best physicians, the best dentists working in our communities. And they're only going to come if we are engaged as institutions of higher ed with our neighbors on these problems. So what Gardner indicated is it was essential. And there's another reason. And it connects to those two. There's no institution that has the resources of higher ed. And I don't mean money, which mm -hmm. I think is important. My institution has lots of resources financially. I don't mean physical plant. And this is a beautiful physical plant. I don't mean just incredibly great histories that we can draw on. Our greatest resource are our students and our faculty and our staff. No other institution has the human resources that are essential to solving the problems of human life and making a great contribution. So the theory that this talks about in a big term is this idea of a democratic I don't mean democratic party, I mean democratic is in democracy, devolution, revolution. Now what do those three terms mean? It means that the idea that government is a catalyst, needs to provide essential funding, which President Foley did when he was with labor and industry in his state as secretary and deputy secretary. Had to do it. He actually supported our work. <laughs> Had to, that's a key job. But it is not sufficient. The idea is that's catalytic money that then gets devolved from federal, state, local government to the community. But it doesn't involve just the community. It taps the resources of faith-based institutions, community organizations, unions, business, health and human services agencies, and higher education. It taps that energy, catalyzes the human resources 
to make a change that can be long-lasting and help societies function. Well, in all work in West Philly, we didn't think of that right away. That's, that's years of work. I, I'm bad at math, but I think we've been at this work some 26 years. Is that 85, 95, 2005? Help me, everybody, right? <laughs> yes, yes. About 26 years of involvement we've been doing this work. And we didn't th think of this initially. But the idea emerges that by working with our communities, we will benefit and learn and these ideas develop. And I use that for myself. That idea came from my working with others, working in my communities. And now I write about it, talk about it, but it came from the practice and the ideas and the research of university. The great social psychologist Kurt Lewin said, if you really want to understand something, try to change it. <laughs> try to change it. The best way to understand the world is to work systematically, intelligently, to change the world for the better. To change the world for the better. So we learned that in this process, and that's the other side why this is so important. Because all of us who are in academia in this room benefit fundamentally and deeply from our partnerships with others to solve the universal problems that are manifested in our community. Let me do a very brief history of our work. And if I'm going too long, sister, you tell me, OK? Five minutes Five is minutes. all I need. I got yeah. it. OK. <laughs> the, I said this work evolved not because we thought of it on an ivory tower, not because we were platonic scholars sitting on the hill, but because we were engaged. And let me talk a little bit about that engagement and this history. We began this work in 1985. Where did it come out of? It came out of an undergraduate seminar I taught with colleagues of mine. And the seminar was looking at the fact that universities should make a difference in the world. And we focused on the problems of universities in communities. And we had a president who also believed in this. We've been very fortunate to have a number of presidents since who believe, but Sheldon Hackney, who is an activist president, said, I believe that by working in our communities, we can make a difference. And my undergraduate students began to work in the community. And it was their work with the neighborhood, coming out of a terrible tragedy. I don't have time to discuss the MOVE tragedy, which was the burning down of a community in West Philadelphia, that from those ashes, our work emerged, working with the neighborhood to make a difference. And therefore, as we worked with the neighborhood, members of the community began to work at a local school. And that's when we saw that schools could be centers of neighborhood. And that's when we learned about Adams and Lillian Wald and John Dewey. And then going fast forward, as we worked in those neighborhoods and schools, we developed courses that integrated research, teaching, service, and learning. Service learning courses that we term in Penn academically based community service. And our approach to academically based community service is that young people, college students, can make a difference in the world while they're students working with faculty and community members. And the most outstanding faculty member in physical anthropology and nutrition the chairman of the department, Frank Johnston, turned his work from Guatemala to West Philadelphia and has developed a project that has existed now for 25 years, helping to improve health and nutrition in that community, running fruit and vegetable stores, growing fruit and vegetables, having young people teach elderly and others about these issues, linking it to his curriculum in college, but to the curriculum of public school students. And the greatest physical anthropologist is working with Penn's leading sociolinguist who's teaching African-American youth better learning of reading using hip-hop culture, not hip-hop language, neighborhood narrative, neighborhood stories to teach standard English. And it's won awards and it's all over the United States. And a group of undergraduates who said to me, and this will be my conclusion, sister, to said to me, Dr. Harkavy, you've been talking about Tom will remember this, developing a health care program linked to the university that will help the neighborhood with our medical school, nursing school, dental school. And they said to me, Dr. Harkavy, you're doing it wrong. You know you claim it has to be a health, a health promotion disease prevention center. These undergraduates said to me in 2002, after I've been working on this for 13 years, do what John Dewey would do. Don't just ask the community who you have to ask, but ask the faculty 
of the various schools, the nursing school, dental school, social policy school, medical school, ask them how they can link to the community. And they designed a proposal that in 2002 led to a health promotion disease prevention center out of a special course that was created for students from Wharton Engineering Arts and Sciences and the, the um, uh, college. And these students working together had a proposal that created a health promotion disease prevention center that now is a fully federally qualified health center serving hundreds of young people at a university assisted community school and their parents, linked to the curriculum of a high school and the curriculum of students in the business school, arts and sciences, design, medicine, nursing, dentistry, all working together to help improve the quality of life and the quality of learning for the children and for adults. So to sum up, the idea is so simple. The idea is such a simple idea. The idea of university-assisted community schools is simple. Academically-based community service is simple. But there's a core idea. The core idea is that our institutions, Catholic colleges, universities such as Penn, whose founder Benjamin Franklin said the purpose of Penn was to educate young people with an inclination, moral, joined with an ability to serve, which ability to serve mankind, one's country, friend, and family was the great aim and end of all learning. So the idea is that all of our institutions have at their core service to others and making a difference. And by focusing on universal problems, poverty, unemployment, poor housing, inadequate education, homelessness, universal problems in every city, in every community, in this country, and unfortunately in the world. By focusing on those universal problems that are manifested in our localities, colleges and universities will advance the education of students, advance learning, advance scholarship, advance the development of America as a fully democratic society and helped to create a society and world in which all of us, everyone, can live a fair, decent, and joyous life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harkavy. As we expected, you move us into a deeper understanding of social fabric and the networking among and between the pieces that are our world and our reality in a wonderful, wonderful way. We'll get back to the democratic devolution, revolution. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Uh, Gray now will bring us, I think, into the breadth of the work through Campus Compact in at least the state of Pennsylvania and maybe some international reference. I leave it to you. Good. Yes, indeed, I have the distinction of being the last speaker. <laughs> So far, um, we will have an opportunity for panel discussion, which will be much more riveting. But I actually am speaking more to students. So those of you who are students, sit up. <laughs> <laughs> because I used to sit where you sit. And the reason that I'm actually here today is because somebody asked me some very probing questions when I was in high school about a service project that I'd been involved in. And um, I won't go into the full story, but I was involved in, sh in uh, distributing food in an emergency s situation in Tanzania during the drought of 1974. So you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> and during that time, we just gave out food to people. We didn't know what we were giving. We just gave out food that was given to us to share with the Africans. We didn't speak Maasai. We, 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 spoke the, we had the greeting word that we knew. But we didn't speak much of the language. Um, but after that happened, I was speaking with a friend of mine who was a nutritionist. And she started asking me questions about what I observed about the children and their hair and what I observed about, was it women that came or was it men and women who came? And she started kind of asking me to think about what I'd done. 
And that was really kind of the beginnings for me of realizing that I am an experiential learner, much like most of you. Now, you learn probably very differently and more sophisticated than I did because you have technology and I'm still learning how to use my phone. <laughs> but we still have a lot of things in common in terms of our inqu inquiry and our interest in life and learning. And so I'm really honored to share this panel with these colleagues who both think and act on really important work. And it's a privilege to be at this institution. I shared with the others earlier that I visited this campus several years ago, and there was something about the heart and soul of this institution that I could, I could see. And I, I travel all over the state visiting our, our member campuses. We have 67, varying from a, a, an institution like University of Pennsylvania to community colleges to small private liberal arts institutions, faith-based institutions, Temple University, state universities, the whole range. So I see all kinds of situations and I truly uh, am proud that I could be a part of this and also excited and anticipate what will be coming next from this institution. And so what I say to you is, to whom much is given, much is required. And this to me is, coming from my tradition, the stewardship of higher education. The stewardship that you have a privilege as students to be sitting here today, to have access to an education. And it compels us all to think, what are we doing with what we have? What do we have that is for others? Is it for ourselves or is it also about what Ira Harkavy alluded to earlier? Is it for the larger good? So to whom much is given, much is required. I really understand this work, this work in terms of prepositions. Ah, oh, English, prepositions. Because to be engaged in this work, an institution really practices prepositions like in, for, among, within, between, with though certainly not prepositions like down the hill, over, instead of, beneath, or against. So those are words that are really integral to the work of civic engagement and the role of the university in creating a social fabric within your community. Martin Luther King said it really well in terms of the purposes of higher education. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively, kind of sounds like the mission statement for this institution, <laughs> to think critically, intelligence plus character. That's the goal of education. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Now, if Martin Luther King had lived in South Africa, he would know that that question, what are you doing for others, is the notion of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is an, is an idea that's very foreign for us here in the United States. We're so individualistic. But again, as, as was alluded to earlier by Dr. Harkavy, it's this idea that we're really connected to each other, that my humanity is bound up in yours. Desmond Tutu talks a lot about this, that who I am and what I do impacts you. And so while I may not know the person that I'm with and I'm serving, we're connected. So that's a question for you to think about. I want to tell you just a little bit about the organization that I work for, and I know that it might be easy for you to turn off right now because uh, it's organizational stuff. But 
I really, for those of you who work in student organizations, you're maybe in a club, or you're an athletic team, or you're in a class, we're talking about organizations because organizations are groups of people. And how you work together and how you function and how you think about what you're doing makes a difference. You all know this. You have healthy clubs and then you have some organizations that just can't ever seem to get off the ground because they don't know what they're doing. So I represent an organization that's trying to be very clear about what we're want to accomplish, what we want to nurture in the state among the 67, 68, sometimes 69, sometimes 75 colleges and universities in the state who are focused on civic engagement. So that means that we have three audiences. We have students, we have faculty, and we have institutional presidents and representatives and administrators. And so um, among this uh, organization, we actually have a lot of small private liberal arts institutions. Actually, 43% of our institutions are faith-based, and out of those 43%, I would say most of them are Catholic institutions. Interestingly enough, 51% of college students in Pennsylvania, on, on Pennsylvania campus compact, campuses are involved in community service. So what's the enrollment here? 1,600. So that would, that would say to me that probably about, for most institutions, half of the students are involved in some kind of service. 800, potentially, here at this institution. And that to me is quite exciting because it means that it's capturing the hearts and minds of students and giving them a chance to really explore and discover and think about really difficult, messy, complex issues in the world around them, which is a part of the role of higher education. So just to give you what that quantitatively looks like, two million hours for college students in Pennsylvania are involved in service. So if you're in a nonprofit, like I am, what we have a little cute little calculation that we have for mm -hmm. what volunteer hour represents. Do you know how much it is? I don't know if I should tell you this because then you'd be asking your club person to sponsor to pay you. But the, volunteer, the hour for volunteer hourly rate that's calculated, so if you ever file on your taxes that you donated 10 hours, is about $18 an hour. All right. <laughs> now this is important because for you as an institution, you can quantify what kind of investment in one way that your students are making and your faculty and your institution. I say that only because it represents something pretty significant in this state and that we have students who want to be connected to their world. Number one mantra that I hear among college students today is, I want to make a difference. Now, it's a little different language than when I was in college. We were a little more politically motivated. We were socially active, but there was a little more of a, of a political agenda to it than I see in today's students. But that's great. We want you to be involved. We want you to connect with your world. We want you to figure out how is it that I can live and breathe and work in this world. So um, that just helps to quantify for you a little bit of, about what's going on in this state. I'm going to make a statement, and it, it, it's been supported by both of the previous speakers because I think that it really really underscores how important this is to each of us in our professions as individuals and as, as this field is growing. So we really do envision, this is our mission statement as an organization, that colleges and universities are vital agents and architects of a diverse democracy. Now more than ever. We have seen, we're probably very tired of hearing about all of the 
stalling that's occurring in Washington. But my contention is that we have been complicit if we don't get involved. And if we want us to have a healthy democracy, we as learners, as individuals who can be trained, skilled, prepared, we have a great opportunity to be able to move us, move us towards that. And this is what is called civic skills and knowledge and um, dispositions, which is one of the things that occurs in, in higher education at this institution as you begin to think about messy issues and social, complex, uh, racial and cultural diversity. So let me just tell you three things that we do as an organization and then I'm going to give you some, some tangible examples too. <coughs> We have three different things that we want to accomplish. One is we want to impact the lives of college students. Now we, we don't do that directly because I'm not a college, I'm not a university. So I work with institutions like Mount Aloysius. So the first thing that we try to do is really encourage what's called college access and success. I'm curious to know how many of you, if you're willing to raise your hand, are first generation college students in this group. God bless you. What courage, what persistence, what tenacity it takes for you to be here. And there were a lot of steps along the way, and I could probably sit down with you like Oprah and talk to you about how you got here. But that's what's called access to college, and it is vital, it's important as a diverse democracy that we don't just try and find people who live at the top of the world, but who live and breathe in the world that's very different than the very, those that have access to everything. So college access and success to us is important. How is it important? Because we believe that civic engagement is a tool to enable people to succeed and move on because it gives them a chance to try to learn and to serve. So that's one way. That's for students. We also think about faculty members. We want to find ways to encourage faculty to pursue scholarship in their engagement work. This means that we're trying to change institutional systems. To be very, very clear, this means that institutions will reward faculty for their scholarship of engagement. This is a tectonic shift in the world of higher education. And for students, it may not, it may not register as being of value to you, but for faculty, you know what I'm talking about. So in other words, teaching a service learning course is not going to compromise the possibility that you're going to receive tenure. Because it has has, over the years, been a fight within the academy for faculty that they are not going to pursue service learning until they've attained tenure because it's too much. It's too different. So the third one, talk about students, talk about faculty. Third one is community. And this is where much of what the work that Ira Harkavy and I are, work, are involved in with the um, anchor institutions work is in community and economic development. You have a president who's been deeply involved in that work. And you've got, in, you've got individuals at this institution who understand that. So it's not, so, so it's, it, is the, it is the answer to the question, for what? What are you doing this for? for? To enhance the lives of your community economically so that you can go on and have healthy, sustainable community. I want to talk just briefly about one of, one of the pieces of service learning that I think is really exciting um, and I think it really deeply is bound to your liberal arts tradition and that it has to do with what I call the power of ideas and the power of innovation. 
The thing that I love about service learning is that it really creates a, a, a more democratic classroom. Faculty, close your ears. It means you lose a little bit of control. But that's actually okay because you open up the classroom, the community is a part of the classroom, and students have a chance to innovate. And this innovation is really important right now here in our current economic reality to be creative and to think about ways in which you can address life, address the challenges that are out there. So service learning has this opportunity three ways. One is through exploratory experiences, one is analytical, and one is generative. I'm going to give you three very tangible examples. These are real examples, much like what Dr. Harkavy uh, shared with you. An exploratory, Spanish majors are assigned to Spanish-speaking pa parents from a local elementary school and interpret school assignments that their children bring home and then create linguistic bridges for parents with their fully functional, fully en English-functioning children. This is a reality in this state. That's an exploratory example. An analytical example is students in an organic chemistry class assess the water qualities, quality levels from a local creek for the local water board. In other words, to assess are chemicals being released into this creek by some kind of industry up creek. So that's an analytical example. The third is generative. Um, it's probably the one that you're not going to be expecting to hear because most people don't think mathematics is very practical. <laughs> but this one is. An applied statistics course integrates service learning by working with a local nonprofit organization in conducting analyses on data gathered from a survey. The students helped design the survey and then they helped which is generative, and then they help analyze the data in the survey, which is vital for nonprofits who often do not have statistical backgrounds, executive directors, and they rely on somebody else to help crunch the numbers so that they, they can then write reports to demonstrate they need more grant money. Very, very tangible examples of how this can be played out. Now, what does this mean for students? This means that you have a chance to explore and uncover real life problems and apply it to academic principles. It makes life your laboratory, your community, which makes it real for you. And so for me, that's what happened when I was a senior in high school. And out of that, I learned a sense of per per personal efficacy. This shows up in the research that we did. A, a sense of personal identity, spiritual growth, moral development, a sense of why are people hungry, interpersonal skills, how to work together in a team. All of these things come out of, of the service learning are these powerful impacts. I could spend, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at the outcomes from service learning. I don't think I really need to make a case for it, but all I'm saying is that in your stewardship as a faculty member and as a student, to whom much is given, much is required. I want to share with you um, one last piece about um, that Ernest Boyer wrote, and again, I think this really draws, it almost sounds like Catholic social tradition when I heard you <laughs> read what you read. Sister Mary Ann, I thought, boy, that sounds just like Ernest Boyer. Good. Ernest Boyer has been a, a, a great thought leader in the world of higher education. This is what he said, higher education should not only prepare students for productive careers, but also enable them to live lives of dignity and purpose. Generate new knowledge and channel their knowledge to humane ends. Also study government and help shape a citizenry that can promote the public good. So the question is, what do you do with what you've been given? How do you 
shape your life and how do you cast your life in your community and in your classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gray, and bringing us back to the classroom and to the practical and to that which uh, is the combination service learning. So I think our panelists did very well. I have to say that they're only five minutes over time, and that's <laughs> wonderful <laughs> given the fact that they could all have spoken uh, for the uh, 40 minutes time. So I'm going to ask them one question, and then they'll be discussing it, and that'll allow you a chance to offer your questions and comments, and we'll close on that. We won't have as much time for discussion as we thought we might. But each of you talked about community. Um, you talked about democracy especially. You talk about the, the sense of uh, empowerment or the, the different ways of uh, generativity with service learning. This is the year 2011. We just celebrated an anniversary which marked a turning point for our nation about the safety of the world the globe on which we live. Um, it's a generation that has uh, come out of several incidences of violence on our college campuses. It's an era that started off maybe with the bowling alone. The individualism, the self-reliance of our nation has begun perhaps to pose its own problems. When you talk about the kind of world that you're envisioning here and that the university or college is going to stimulate. So, you wanted to talk a little bit about obstacles. I see quite a few. So maybe talk a little bit about, are we losing ground? Are we <laughs> making headway? Are we, in this um, effort, uh, a Don Quixote kind of figures hitting at windmills here? One of the things that I think um, brings us together, unfortunately, is grief. Um, so whether it's 9-11 and the anniversary of 9-11 and how we were all riveted to the television the other day, or um, and we feel the grief of people and we feel the grief of our nation, um, or it can be, you know, you know how you come together with your loved ones when you're grieving whatever it is that we are grieving. It, that brings us together as community. Um, and it's unfortunate that at times it seems like only that. Uh, I think one of the things that keeps us from coming together as a community, moments of, um, moments of grief are moments where we're shocked, we're out of our comfort zone. Mm. And I, I often say um, that you know, we live life as if we're on a moving sidewalk. You know those things in airports that you just, you know, you step on and indeed at the end of it, they have to tell you the moving sidewalk <laughs> is ending now, please look down, the moving side, because, it, and that's a metaphor for our lives. We get up in the morning and we do the same thing. You know, you drive to work. Have you ever, um, on a Saturday, maybe when you're not in school and you're driving, for faculty, I suppose this would be true because many of the students live on campus, but you find yourself here when you were going to go to the grocery <laughs> store because you're on automatic pilot, you know? And I think... It's a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> in the mountains, in in the the mountains, mountains of Pennsylvania, it's a little harder. It's a little harder, but I think yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I Philadelphia. think... That's right. And I think, I think the, the opportunity to reflect together in symposia like this or... I mean... Where are those opportunities? And we need more as a country than only around grief. Let me say it that way. Mm -hmm. But I hope we're not just batting at windmills. I mean, I think we really, we really have a faith, not just a religious faith, but a faith mm -hmm. that says life can be better for more uh, across the world. I think that, you know, just to pick up um, Sister on that last statement, um, I think first of all, that that's a crucial aspect that, that in, the, the, the healthiest stance to the world is optimism. Mm. It really is a personal importance that the sense of efficacy, which we heard um, a, a moment ago uh, from Shar, the, the idea that human beings can make things better mm -hmm. and that we can do something to improve the world is crucial. 
But that alone, and I think that's, that is the foundation. But after that, I think there also is a sense that of responsibility to act to actually make those improvements. Now, I think if you were to ask, really, you asked a very good question about are we going forward or back. In higher education, uh, it's undecided. <laughs> I think it's undecided mm -hmm. because we're faced with rampant commercialism in our campuses. I don't know if any of you saw this article that I taught to my class this week, teach, they read it, and we discussed in this article in Sunday's Times of colleges that will be named later. I will not name them at all, but you read the article where their events are all focused on corporate activities, wow. on Target, on going their mm -hmm. evening going shopping. And this is what college being dressed up as an American Express, whatever, and they, this becomes their focal point. The question is, what is education for? Is it for profit or is it for virtue? Is it to help young people develop fully? And that's not decided. Mm -hmm. And I think that the issue of how it gets decided is what we do. So even though at the core, I believe, you have to have that bigger faith, the faith that the world is, at, is to be improved, that when we leave this world, we have responsibilities that are numerous. But one core one is to make sure we've done something to make it a better place. That's mm -hmm. core. But from that, we then have the personal responsibility and institutional responsibility to face reality. And the reality is that we do face these conflicts. The positive sign is, Campus Compact has grown from three institutions in 1985 to over 1,200, right. 1,200 institutions. Mm -hmm. The positive sign is a colleague of mine, Matt Hartley, who studies educational reform, said the spread of service learning is the most extensive pedagogical change since the founding of the research university. So there are these enormous hopes. And the other hope is the young people in this audience. Because fundamentally, it is going to be not just your responsibility, but your generation is more engaged in service than any preceding you. Your generation has had more community service and service learning experiences than any other. And your responsibility is to take those experiences and ask older folks like us to do more, <laughs> to push our institutions, and even to ask the new president as wonderful as he is, to do more. So because of that, I think we're moving ahead, and we're moving ahead. Good. Do you think we're moving ahead, Char? Do you have a look at at least Pennsylvania? I, I do. I actually think in terms of, um, I think about the summer and, the, well, the spring, Arab Spring, mm -hmm. and remarkable mm -hmm. what's occurred mm -hmm. in Egypt, Tunisia, what is happening in Libya. It may not be the way that we want it to happen, but we're not, the, you know, the United States is not the center of the universe. I know that's hard to mm -hmm. believe, but we're really not the center of the world. And um, that to me is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. the, the, and I just, I did exactly what they asked me not to do. Sorry about that. Um, I was talking away from my microphone. The other piece that um, I'll say very quickly is that Ira and I attended a conference in Oslo this summer around reimagining democratic societies and the role of higher education. We had a wonderful week there. We came back and the following week is when the carnage occurred, mm. not just in the city but out on an island. And the response from our colleagues, the Norwegians, was quite remarkable. And they said, this work is important for us to have decency, kindness, respect for one another. And I found myself thinking, I'm not sure that we responded in that way at 9-11. At 9-11, mm hmm So, I just, uh, so yes, I am, I am optimistic. I am a person of hope, yes. Good, good. Do you have any comments or questions that you'd like to offer to pose to the uh, panelists here to engage them in conversation or yourselves in conversation? Thank you, Victoria, good.
environment at the university, and a lot of people have the desire to want to help. I still notice that a lot of times we look at how much is going on in the world and how big the problems are. A lot of times students face like just this helplessness and this hopelessness that they can't do anything, and a lot of times it leads to like an apathy. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is anything that can be done to help people like that realize that they can do stuff and to motivate them to actually work at it? Okay. Good, Victoria. I'm just going to summarize in case in the back. So basically, she's suggesting that with all the possibilities and the work that young people have done, how young people have been exposed to various opportunities, both of education but also of service. But the question is, the world seems to be have overwhelming problems, which discourages and may immobilize and force or not force, but at least the choice of people is to move back into a comfort zone and to a, a lack of activity. So I'm sure there's wisdom here. Would someone like to start to address the question? Well, first I want to say that was an exceptionally good question. Yeah. And, I'm going to be, and I think that's a real feature. And I'm going to be critical of higher education. And I'll even, I had a student of mine who was a master's student who was doing her master's thesis on the sociology department. And she wrote, the sociology department looks at poverty. Mm. Mm. Now, if you look at poverty, wow. you get discouraged. If you study urban conditions, you get discouraged. But if you study urban conditions linked to trying to change those conditions while you're a student, you get hope. Because efficacy isn't my solving the world's problems. That's not really, it is how I could be, make a difference in where I am how I can make a difference in the work I do. So where college students, I think, can be hopeful, if there are curricular opportunities to really do something and use your ideas, not just your labor, but your ideas with the faculty to make a difference, so you don't look at poverty, you work to reduce poverty. With a vision of eradicating it. But it's not just, it's not gonna be eradicated like that. You have that vision, you study it, you talk about it, but you act in the world to make the world better. There's a great philosopher of science, Francis Bacon, who said the purpose of knowledge is the relief of man's estate, mm. to improve the world. But you can do it not by just looking at it, discussing it, but actually do it in the world through your courses, through your curriculum, in the community of Crossan then you'll feel hopeful and not hopeless. Anyone else like to respond? And we'll I take would, another question, so get ready. I would just say, you know, uh, small steps right. can that's make a it. huge difference. Said, and that's right. just to follow up on what that's Iris said. Right. Small things. Just as you all know that you can make a difference in your own family with right. small steps, you can make a difference. The other thing I would say, hopefully in your classes you're reading about some inspirational people right. who sort of tripped into making a difference. <laughs> so sometimes right. it's just our faith and our hope and our optimism, if you will, mm -hmm. that carry us, carries us someplace or our service, it carries us someplace and we make a difference before we even know it. Right. You know, it's and if you read right. about some of those great figures, they tripped into it. Exactly they didn't right. decide to do something big like Martin Luther King right. or... Right. Well, or if we might share our foundress here, Catherine, Catherine Macaulay, Macaulay, if I she might tripped step... tripped into it. Tripped into it, indeed. Yeah. And now 7,000 women, several decades after her life... Decades. Creating <laughs> decades. More than decades? Centuries. <laughs> Centuries. Yeah. How time flies when you yes. ask. <laughs> any other question or comment that you'd like to offer? Yeah. Uh, we have a few more minutes. No? All right, then I'm going to thank our panelists for their wonderful input. And they'll be here. There's a reception for the panels in the uh, Wolf Coon room. And I think uh, Dr. Foley would like to have the last word, which is more than appropriate. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Sister Helen. Just a couple of very quick things. One thanks to, to our terrific panelists. Dr. Stevens, I don't, you, you did a short course in Catholic and Mercy 
social thinking. Uh, I don't know how you got all that in, but I got a lot out of it and appreciate that. You also gave real depth to the word hospitality, which mm -hmm. is one of our core values. And of course, those two stories, Daisy and T. Essence, were poignant and really perfect examples, and thank you for that. Ira, no surprise, mm. you gave us a short course that went from John Dewey to John Gardner um, <laughs> with a lot of meat to it, and thank you for walking us down that road of the democratic devolution revolution, which I know is all about where you started, which is communities and school-based action. Dr. Gray, Ubuntu, I'm going to remember that, um, and for your excellent examples of three different kinds of Mm -hmm. Service learning, I appreciate those. Uh, they really taught me a lot. Sister Helen, as always, you're very patient. You're very caring in the way that you put all of this together over many months of preparation and the way you handled this discussion today. And we want to thank all of you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Sister Helen, is, Helen Marie is correct. It's not a one-off. in your. Packets. I want everybody to notice at some point, take this one out and look at it because we listed on here, there's seven different things that we are doing at this institution right now this year that have to do with growing our sense of the social fabric. Um, that what we do in this conversation today is not a one-off experience for us. I also want you to know that this conversation will be available on Public Access TV, who are here with us today. We're hoping on PCN, which is our statewide public service network, and each of our panelists prepared a paper for us. We'll be taking that and their dialogue today and putting together a monograph that we will send out on this topic, the university's role in the social fabric uh, from our institution. And uh, uh, lastly and, and finally, we invite all of you to join us in the Wolf Kuhn room in a few moments for a reception and continue the conversation with these outstanding people. Thank all of you uh, for your attention and for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you.